everyone and welcome to the Ultimate Supply Chain Podcast where we invite industry leaders to answer burning questions and give in-depth insight into the world of logistics. This week we're exploring real estate solutions and the role it's playing in the supply chain industry in such rapid, crazy, changing times. I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, Ben Siegelman, Global Capital Markets Lead here at DHL Supply Chain and Yang Gora, Global Head of Product Strategy for Real Estate Solutions. Jan and Ben, welcome to the podcast. Can you each start by introducing yourselves and the roles you play here at DHL Supply Chain? Let's start with you, Jan. Absolutely. Delighted to be here, Lou. I've been with the company for a number of years, and I think the exciting part has been the last 10 years and seeing how the supply chains of our customers have really evolved during the, you know, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, So my role is really to globally support our customers and help them with their real estate needs, which are such a big part of their supply chains. Thanks, Jan. And Ben, how about you? Thanks, Lou. Um, Hi, everybody. Great to be here today. Um, Ben Siegelman, and I've been at DHL Real Estate Solutions now for three years, um, and I lead the capital markets. um, And effectively, what that means is that I help find commercial solutions for our real estate as we trade the developments that we build into um, the real estate market. Brilliant. So already two very, very different roles in um, what is a fascinating part of supply chain. Who knew all of this happened in supply chain? Can we start with a quick overview of what real estate in logistics means? What sort of properties are we talking about? Yeah, so Lou, I think it's really interesting and it really ranges from very large automated facilities down to small cross docks that are really serving you know the inner city let's say and and same day deliveries so it really ranges and it's been interesting how it's really changed over time as well so i think there was a huge trend towards regional or national distribution and now we're seeing a lot of things coming back closer to metropolitan areas that that's really interesting and and what is it that drives that Jan, typically? I think at the end of the day, it's end consumer demand, which I think all of us have seen the rise of e-commerce and and all these trends. I think what's interesting for us is the trends and the buzzwords become reality. And and we see that from our customers. We see a lot of our customers kind of going through these changes and having changing needs. I think, you know, what I'm proudest of in our team is the way that we've been able to kind of develop some of these new facilities and new modes of of operating them. I think the core function of supply chain is our operational knowledge. And whether it's a fully automated FMCG facility for a customer or multiple customers, or if it's retail that's delivering same day, you know, or or doing returns for another customer, very different solutions, very different staff levels, automation, etc., and very different real estate needs. But I think that's what you get when, you know, you're really focused on customer solutions and driving things from a customer perspective of whatever it is that, that needs to get done. There are creative solutions to do it. Great. Thanks, Jan. And, and Ben, what's happening in terms of investment? How, how's the market changing? Um, you said you've been here for three years. What changes have you seen over that time? Well, I mean, during the last three years, the, the, the biggest impact to the markets that we're working in has been the um, uh, COVID pandemic. Um, I think, you know, logistics at the start of this was viewed as something that was interesting. There was a rise in e-commerce. There was perhaps a shift slightly away from retail um, as this was something that was happening um, along a sort of normal trend. But COVID and the pandemic changed that at such an accelerated pace in terms of online um, purchasing and and socializing and working. And ultimately what that has done is that shifted the dynamic away from office and retail investment from investors and towards logistics um, because they've understood the need, the future trends that will keep changing and pushing in this direction and making it all the more important for them to have as part of their wider global portfolio mix. And have you seen much change and much difference regionally? Is, are those trends different by region or, or globally? Is it kind of there or thereabouts, the same sort of trends? 
absolutely global. Um, I don't think there's one place um, within our operations, and, and we're now in over in, in terms of real estate solutions, we are delivering um, real estate um, within over 20 plus different countries. And in every single one of those places, investors have the same sentiment, whether it's a large global investor or a local investor. They all want logistics to be part of their portfolio. Right. And, and, and Jan, can you give us some examples, perhaps, of, of customers that have been looking for, for space and the sort of issues that they're facing at the moment? What do they typically come to you and ask for? Yeah, so I think a lot of, you know, we've got kind of customers in two camps, if you will. So one has kind of realized that, you know, their supply chains need to change. And and a lot of them said that before the pandemic. And the pandemic was kind of push that to accelerate that change in a way. So I think some of them are strategically approaching it. We've got a customer in the UK, for example, that really wanted to come out of a legacy portfolio. They said, we want two mega sites that are not dedicated to them, but nearly dedicated to them that incorporate a lot of automation and investment. And, and those are their sites for the next 20 years. And we were able to work with them, find the right locations, you know, build those bespoke kind of hubs for them. That's on the one extreme, right? That's kind of what you get from, you know, planning and thinking ahead. But a lot of customers don't have that kind of, you know, ability or comfort or, you know, that kind of strategic view. It's more, I need space in the next six months. And, and we have a number of customers like that. What we've been able to do in some cases is, you know, we're buying land and, and starting development ahead of need because we see the trends, right? We see what's happening. And we have a customer that we're working out with right now in the retail space, and we're able to provide them 40,000 square meters by the summer, which is when they need it. And then we can build them another 80,000 by the time next, next summer comes. And those are solutions which, you know, because we have campuses, which means, you know, more than one building in a location. And, you know, the, the big benefit of that is obviously the labor as well as, you know, some of the other resources that you can flex. But a lot of customers, as I said before, you know, through the pandemic and even without the pandemic, to be honest, they just they realize that they have needs because their end consumers have, you know, changing habits, etc. Right. It's it's no longer about filling the shelf on the supermarket in the supermarket. It's about delivering goods to the to to the door right of, of the end consumer. And I think that has required a lot of space and, and different space. And yeah, as I said before, it's, it's really two different dynamics. One is much more strategic where we can kind of plan, say, okay, from the current portfolio, how do we move to the future? And then on the other side, you've got the people who need space, you know, I'm not going to say yesterday, but in six months. And I think there we have to proactively, you know, uh, go out into the market, secure land, start building buildings almost. So what sort of trends are you seeing at the moment? I, I'm, I'm guessing that post-pandemic or as we start to come out of the pandemic, you're seeing more of a demand for space where we can facilitate e-commerce type solutions. But have the trends changed very much in just the last few months, perhaps? So I think these trends have been around for a few decades. We've seen automation, e-commerce, you know, and, and Everything that's come out of the pandemic, the labor shortages and all those things are just the next level of that, if you will. So I think what customers have been looking for flexibility for, for years, and I think the way to get there is, is perhaps a lot more through automation, a lot fewer kind of bespoke solutions, if you will, in, in some ways. So the, again, the campus concept, you know, sharing labor, e-commerce has resulted in a, in a large surge in returns as well which, you know, is one of those value added services that requires people, it requires space, etc. But the value you can create within logistics is incredible. We have an operation that, that I walked recently, where about 20% of the returns can be, you know, reprocessed and resold, with never leaving that facility. And that that is a tremendous savings for the supply chain, right? And, and for the customer as well. Uh, there's been quite a lot in the press about supply and demand, particularly around real estate. Um, to what extent does that vary by region? I mean, look, I'm I'm from the UK. Jan, I think the clues in your accent, you're clearly not from around the same parts that I am. Do you see a lot of difference in supply and demand around real estate 
globally? Yeah, I think, you know, real estate fundamentally is, is partly driven by, you know, the, the land prices and, and those things. And, and then the labor drives it as well, as well as transportation. So we're developing multi-story uh, warehouses in Japan, for example, right, and, and other parts of Asia. Whereas we probably wouldn't do that in the U.S., you know, because land prices are much lower. So I think it's fundamentally driven by the market. I don't know, Ben, if, if you have a view to that. Yeah. Look, global supply of logistics is, it, is at its lowest ever recorded level. And it's not forecast to really catch up at the moment either. There's, um, you know, land is more difficult to have control of uh, than ever before. Mm-hmm. Um, And also we're now facing an issue with growing construction costs as well, which means this puzzle of piecing this all together makes it more uh, difficult for occupiers to actually find the location that they want to end up to be in. However, what we've done at Real Estate Solutions is is really look at the fundamentals of where those location um, points are at their most optimal in terms of transportation, labour, etc. as Jan's already said. But we've also looked at, um, you know, building up a good um, strategic land um, ownership um, globally that means we can have access to that and then, you know, start to build out on it as and when we we have the opportunity with our customers or the business. So typically we kind of keep a bank of portfolio, if you like, and then use that as customers come on board or, or their, their, their needs change. Yeah, I mean, we've looked at a number of different solutions. Um, one is obviously buying land. We've also looked at buying existing buildings um, that DHL has been um, a tenant of, and then either investing right. in that real estate, existing real estate to modernize it um, from both uh, not only a technological point of view uh, or the condition of the building, but also from the ESG credentials point of view. And that ultimately then provides an additional benefit for our customers over the longer term. Um, But, you know, I think with the name Real Estate Solutions, we like to think a little bit differently. And so long as real estate's involved um, and we can try to, um, you know, think uh, ahead of where the competition is, then uh, we've been able to come up with some quite exciting different uh, opportunities globally. And, and look, I referenced it at the top of the call. I love spending time with you guys because you always tell me something that I didn't know. And there's something quite interesting about real estate. It isn't just about buying a piece of land. And, and I love some of the stories that you've shared with me in the past around um, some of the work you've done. If you work for DHL, you will know that we've received a lot of awards for being a great place to work. Can you just talk a bit about how the res team is helping to build those great workplaces? Yeah, Absolutely. I think this is really, really exciting for us. You know, to be honest, a lot of our developers come from the external development world and building for our own colleagues is is different, you know. And I think we are one of those companies that is great to work for. I think we're really focused on that. So some of the things that we do are, it, it's surprising in a way, but it's pretty basic. You know, it's it's looking at, you know, natural light. It's looking at sound levels. It's providing nice cafeterias. Uh, nice parking, safe places, and, you know, safety is so paramount to all of our operations. So making sure that, you know, the truck traffic and the car traffic and the pedestrian traffic are all separate. Um, Looking at, you know, I think we're doing a lot in terms of new cafeteria space again, as I mentioned. And one thing that strikes me always when I walk a warehouse is, you know, what the people really care about. So they care about the offices being near um, close to the to the workplace so that employees feel invited to talk to management. I think they care about restrooms and having enough and, and close enough. And those are things that, you know, we're, we're very much looking at when we're designing a new warehouse. So I think what makes us unique is that we get so much operational insight from people who, you know, run warehouses every day because they're part of our team. So I, I think that's the big difference to external developers. Yeah, that's one of the things I always find fascinating, the fact that you do spend time researching with our own colleagues and and building into our solutions what you've learned, perhaps from one of our last installations. I think, you know, that continuous improvement is definitely something that that sets us apart with our real estate solutions. I love that. 
Um, you mentioned safety being a basic value. And I guess that you've also covered the social part of ESG. What else are we doing to make sure our customers hit their targets around that whole ESG agenda? Yeah, so it was interesting. A couple of years ago, you know, we had a, a few life science customers come to us and say, you know, we're really concerned about carbon. How soon do you think we can do something about this? And, and we looked at each other and we said, you know, some of the buildings that we're building today are not are, are going to be carbon neutral if we do a few things, right? If, if we make a few investments. So we've built our first three carbon neutral operations. You know, we completed those in the last few months. And it was really nice because we had been thinking along this, this path anyway, right? So, so mm-hmm. I think customers came to us and, and we were able to deliver. I think we are committed to have all of our facilities, all of the new facilities be carbon neutral. And is that coming as a result of customer demand or, or is that part of our own ESG agenda or perhaps a bit of both? Yeah, so I think it's it's part of it's clearly part of the DPDHL agenda and, and supply chain spe- specifically. So by 2025, we want to be carbon neutral across our warehouses. But it's also coming from, you know, some of our customers are asking for it actively, you know, because they have their own agendas. And I think it's really nice to be able to marry the two and... You know, our role, as has been said, as part of Real Estate Solutions is to be maybe not on the cutting edge, but in some ways, yes, to be kind of pushing ourselves and, and being ahead of the industry. You know, I like to think that a lot of people talk about things and, and you know, it's great. We actually, you know, I see our team doing things, right, and delivering these things. Well, to that point, Jan, at the moment, you know, we are also delivering it and investors are demanding it and not many of our competitors mm-hmm. in the development space are actually able to put this all together to find a sort of holistic solution such as we have and that we're planning to do and, and to include all of the accreditation that goes along with this that investors most highly prize. I mean, it's a huge piece of work, but something we, we've taken the um, you know, the, the challenge forward. And I think, you know, we are going to produce some of the best uh, real estate examples of what ESG should be into the future. That's really good to hear. Look, there's lots in the press at the moment, and it's something that we're all very aware of right at the centre of our world. There is loads of disruption in the world, and the name of the game is supply chain resilience. Can we talk a little bit about how real estate helps ensure that our customers can supply stock no matter what's going on in the world? Yeah, so I think it goes back to this, you know, needing space within the next six months kind of example that we have with this retail Mm -hmm. customer that we're working with right now. So I think we can give some flexibility, but real estate by its core, you know, needs to be built, needs to be committed to, et cetera. So I think we're making those commitments. We're making those investments to, to Ben's point. You know, we're building out quite a portfolio across Europe. And, and I think that's one way that we can provide that flexibility, you know, is building ahead of demand and having the space ready. I think also from an investment point of view as well, you know, investors look at DHL, the, the quality covenant that it is. And, you know, there's a flight to that quality. Of everybody wants to be invested in that group that can provide uh, and facilitate a strength against some of those disruptions in the market, such as we can. And that value is something that is prized very highly and will continue to be so into the future as we build out our portfolios. Indeed. So look, I don't want to put w- words in your mouth, but I'm, I think I'm hearing that sometimes real estate is less about cost and more about the future, resilience in the future and, and the quality um, that, that takes our customers into that future fair to say absolutely from my standpoint you know I, I think cost comes into it but i think it's it's what you can do with that real estate you know we have examples of you know building taller buildings for example so they can the cube is bigger right so then you're not talking about mm-hmm. cost per square meter or square foot it's really about the pallets right or if you include some automation or mezzanines and all those kinds of things the math is just different you can fit a lot more product into that smaller footprint let's say and and the math can can really work yeah and um listen you talk about mezzanine um i was lucky enough to visit manton wood um back in the summer and the pride 
um, with which the employees took me to the mezzanine, showed me some of the packaging solutions, just reminded me of the point you made a minute ago, Jan, about you know, including our colleagues as part of that design, understanding what they want and, and delivering, at least to a certain extent, to the specifications that they're describing that, that will make their lives easier and more enjoyable in the workplace. Yeah, I, I second that. You know, I, I get to walk quite a few warehouses, right? I, I get to go look at land as well, right? So I get to see the full cycle of it. And my proudest moment is always, you know, meeting customers that love the new warehouse and what it enables them to do and the growth. We have some, you know, I have a young daughter. And, and so some of the, you know, toy manufacturers are some of my favorite customers, right? Because I'm a consumer, right, at the end of the day. And I get frustrated when it takes a week for a, for a package to arrive, right? And I know what we're doing for their supply chain. I know how those buildings fit into that network and what they enable. Yeah, good, good to know. Um, finally, guys. I'd like to just touch on what are your predictions for um, what we're likely to see around developments in real estate solutions over the next couple of years? Well, I think there's um, we're going to see more of a focus on the impact of technology on the buildings, um, you know, not only from what we do internally in terms of the automation and the robotics that we might install, but also how the fabric of the building then relates to how we use um, logistics going forward. I mean, we're looking at how solars, uh, so solar panels, photovoltaics, um, how those uh, uh, can help us meet part of our uh, carbon neutrality, but there's all sorts of other ways in which we can expand that to help us think about battery storage, and other forms of energy that can be produced through uh, the building and also some of the benefits that alternative uh, technologies can provide in terms of uh, the various reduction in carbon output as well, such as ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, you know, just the positioning of the windows in the building can have a huge impact, but technology can help mm -hmm. us think about that within clever designs. And I think there's there's still a lot more to come here. Um, and I think it'll be a, an interesting uh, difference within probably the next five years. And for me, it's, it's really, I think these workplaces of the future for logistics are also changing. I think the roles are changing. I think it's less and fewer repetitive tasks. It's much more, you know, I've seen robotics and, and all those things. And all of that requires people. It requires engineers. It requires people who can, you know, work with algorithms, et cetera. And I think we're going to need a workforce of the future for logistics, right, to run these, these warehouses. And I think the warehouses are becoming more and more networks, right? So how do we create electricity, for example, and then charge the fleet is one of those things that we're addressing today because it will be a challenge 10 years from now, right? Wow, that, that sounds really fascinating. It, and these, it's like I said at the, t at the top of our conversation here, these are things that you don't necessarily think about when somebody says, go and speak to these guys about real estate solutions. It's so much more than um, a really massive shed. Not wishing to um, underplay what you do, but it's so much more than a really massive shed. Um, so listen, I think we're, we're just about to run out of time here. One of the questions I ask all our guests is to give us an example of your most proudest moment where you have helped people um, connect people and improve lives. Can you give us an example, starting with you, Jan? Yeah, absolutely. Though. So I think for me, you know, one of my proudest moments was in, uh, in Melbourne, in Australia, you know, and, and looking at operations, I got to, to be there a couple of times. I saw some of the, the older legacy operations that we have for life science. And just the challenge, you know, of, of having a building that grew over time, operation that, that grew over time, and some of the staff not really happy. I mean, the facilities were, you know, left a lot to be desired. And then seeing them a couple of years later in a brand new facility. And as you said, you know, the pride that you see in the people and, you know, the customers very, very happy, right? Quarterly reviews and, and growth, right? That's, that's the other thing. Everybody wants to be part of the growth. And I think new facilities enable that. I think they change the game in a way. And coming to work should be fun for all of our colleagues. 
So whatever we can do to, to make that happen, I think that's that's the passion of our team, right? We want to create you know amazing environments for our employees at the end of the day. So true. Ben, do you have an example? I think I'm, I think I'm relatively similar to Jan, um, and I think at the moment one of the one of the live aspects that we're working on is the integration of the ESG elements within our buildings that we're developing and we're selling to investors and the investors really you know are so impressed with how we're looking not only about solving for now but solving for the next five or ten years and how much further ahead of the competition that that is that it makes me proud to be part of this because you don't have to do this there's obviously a a, a, a great moral um, position um, but I feel that we are um, ethically, you know, in the right place. We have the backing of the group. We have the backing of our operations. Um, and, and this is going to be something that I think propels DHL to a next level in terms of how investors look at us. And it's great to be part of that. So I want to ask, you know, when when we're investing in innovation around centres like, um, you know, around our real estate centres, who, who pays for that? Do we pay for it or does the customer pay for it? Or how does that work? Well, I, I, I think this is so interesting and it's something I've raised a lot in different panels that I've been part of. But I think the, you know, the investors who will really attract the sellers of these developments in the future are the ones who will provide the solution for that. At the moment, very much the investor buys the fabric of the building, everything internal very much for the tenant to deal with and it's kind of a short sighted perspective as to how this really works because the investor should want the tenant to stay there as long as possible so if there's a way of helping the tenant helping the occupier you know meet some of that huge investment that is required for that internal fit out and fitting and technology and you know commitment then they should be wanting to do this and I, I think it'll change because I think investors are becoming more sophisticated in how they look at and understand logistics. It's no longer uh, a group operating within a box. It's, you know, an intelligent industry representing a number of different sectors in our economy, fueling the economy, keeping the economy moving, that, you know, is also driving the returns for investors. So correlating this somehow together and, and you know, providing a, a more holistic, bigger, investment package i think will be something that that will come in time um but it's uh yeah it's a complicated journey so um so guys what do you see as headwinds in the future for real estate um well i mean look at the moment there's been a lot in the press about rising inflation and how that will potentially impact on consumer demand as well as then filtering back to how occupiers are able to actually afford um you know the 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 occupation of the logistics units, etc. Along with the rising inflation, there's also the threat of interest rates rising. Um, and those interest rates are closely aligned to how investors then value the real estate that they're buying into. Um, at the moment, we don't see foresee a, a, a huge um, growth in those rates, but there's always that uh, potential, especially with the geopolitical issues mm. that we're currently experiencing globally. It's a really, really great message to end on, Ben. Thanks so much. Ben and Jan, thank you for your time today. As usual, um, I've learned from you. Um, it's been great to, to talk to you. And it looks like we've reached the end of our journey for this session. If you'd like to join us and explore another key supply chain topic, please subscribe and make sure you never miss one of our episodes. Thanks for joining us and we'll speak next time.